Colorado's COVID-19 numbers keep looking better. We're directly asking the governor what needs to happen for Coloradans to get some relief from restrictions, especially when it comes to senior living center visits. A prominent realtor in Denver fired for taking Black Lives Matter signs out of the neighborhood where she sells homes. A congressional candidate in Colorado winks and nods at a bonkers conspiracy theory that actor Tom Hanks is a cannibal and a pedophile. The cost of fighting Colorado's fires. Who pays when our state burns? And the Coloradan creating a permanent reminder of what happened for American women a century ago today. That's next. If Colorado is not ready to roll back social distancing restrictions, perhaps we're at least ready for a conversation about what it might take, when it might be a smart idea to make those steps. Some of our COVID-19 statistics are in the best shape since the pandemic began. So today, our Steve Steger asked the governor and one of Colorado's top infectious disease experts about setting a standard for when we can take steps back toward a normal life. Steve? And Kyle, first I asked the governor, and in fairness, these remote press briefings make it pretty difficult to follow up on a question. And I asked a couple of questions at the same time, but Governor Polis did not touch my question about whether or not there's a magic number, maybe a metric he needs to see before easing things like the 10 o'clock uh, last call. The governor did make news on his Answer to me, though, because he appears to be about to budge in letting people inside to see their loved ones inside long term care facilities. But we recognize that not everybody, particularly those who are ill, not everybody can successfully engage in outdoor visitation uh, or some might simply prefer indoor visitation. So uh, if those guidelines have not been issued and we're happy to 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 respond to you on that, um, they will be in the next few days. I've I've already reviewed them. So that's positive news uh, for some of the families that we've been talking to who say that their loved ones may not be able to make it outside for those visitations and that isolation was starting to take over. I'm still waiting to hear back from multiple members of the governor's team to clarify when those guidelines will actually be released. We couldn't find them today. Back to that metric question, though. I asked infectious disease specialist Dr. Michelle Barron this afternoon why she thinks the governor is holding back on that. And she said it's likely because it's not as simple as it seems. That it's probably not one metric and it's probably multiple things that they're looking at and it's just there's not one magic number it's sort of well okay we have seen a decrease in the number of positive tests and we've seen a number of hospitalizations and this county is no longer problematic and or you know so i bet it's a little bit more complex than just say we got to be at 10 or 5 or 2 and that's the answer but I, but I asked Barron, wouldn't it make it easier for some people to just follow the rules if the governor gave them the goalpost? And she said, quite honestly, a lot of people who don't want to follow those rules just aren't going to do it anyway, even if they hear about the potential goalpost. Now, while the governor made news on that long-term care facility uh, guideline, several reporters pressed him about last call today. That executive order is mo moving it to 10 p.m. It expires this weekend. The governor would not commit to whether or not he'll extend that order, only saying it'll be a long time, Kyle, before we return to life, nightlife as we knew it. Yeah. <laughs> But yet it expires this weekend and business owners are looking for certainty. That's the thing that I just keep coming back to, Steve. Like, I get that these decisions are complicated. I know that they have consequences, that they're not foolproof. At the end of the day, the reason that, that people are asking us and asking the governor and other folks is not because they want to be a pain in the backside. They just want some certainty about their personal lives and about their businesses. Well, some people want to be a pain in the backside, but there are a lot of people who are just like that, who just want to know. And a lot of people on that senior care front said that they just want to know that there's a plan in the works. They don't necessarily need it to be immediately. They just want to know that someone somewhere is thinking about this and thinking about potentially someday being able to reunite inside one of those facilities. The good news is it sounds like that's happening. All right. One of the best pains in the backside in the business. Steve Steger right there. Thank you, Steve. Colorado's positivity rates fluctuate day to day. So what we do is we smooth out the peaks and the valleys and the numbers for you by looking at a seven-day moving average of the percentage of tests coming back positive. Right now it's at 2.71%. That is excellent compared to what's being seen around America right now. Colorado's 
positivity rate was in the high 4% a couple weeks ago. Health experts used 5 and 10% as the positivity rates that you really don't want to exceed. Hospitalizations, you'll remember from when all this started, they are our key indicator because they sort out the most serious cases in our state. 153 hospitalizations for COVID-19 right now, down significantly from weeks past. You'll love to see that downward slope. One of Denver's best-known realtors has been fired by Remax after nearly 50 years with that company. Remax says Denise Rich was removing Black Lives Matter signs from an affluent neighborhood where she sells homes. Rich has been a prominent real estate agent in Denver for decades. She's been with Remax since 1973, specializing in luxury homes. People in the Hilltop area posted in next door about Rich taking Black Lives Matter yard signs. Remax Alliance owner Chad Oxner told me today that the decision to terminate Rich was simple. He told me, quote, we're not a company that can condone trespassing on people's private property and theft. I asked Rich by phone about the removal of the Black Lives Matter signs and the end of her nearly half century career with Remax. She said, quote, you distort the news. I can't talk to people who distort the news. Then she hung up. Question. If you knew who would win the game ahead of time, would you still watch it on TV? That is not a passive-aggressive comment about the fact that our bosses are showing classic Broncos games on Channel 20 these days. Now, I'm talking about the national political conventions, because you know who's going to win the nomination at the end of the convention. Politics guy Marshall Zellinger, why exactly should we still watch? There are some pretty good musical acts I hear. I guess because it gives you unfiltered access to the politicians and lawmakers. You're not hearing it through us in a pre-produced story. You're hearing directly from them, albeit in a pre-produced way since it's virtual and not live in person. It's also a time when every elected representative wants to talk, like Democratic Senator Michael Bennett, who, while running for president, was not on the Joe Biden bandwagon. I asked him about his comments from June 2019 compared to his feelings today. Does I, Joe Biden represent the future? No, I don't think so. I think I think we it's time for a new generation of leadership. I think that the Democratic voters through this process reached a conclusion, which was they believed Joe Biden was the, the best option for beating Donald Trump. And I actually can't argue with that judgment. I think that's a rational and reasonable judgment. I I did want to have a new generation of leadership. I think it's time for us to do that. But I also believe it's incredibly important for us to beat uh, Donald Trump. It's along the lines of the, no, I don't want to be a senator hammering for Senate. Uh, Bennett is touring Colorado this week. And as you pointed out last night, at least on Twitter, Kyle, he's one of the few previous presidential candidates not speaking at the convention. Although he's doing tours of state Colorado State Convention, he's talking to them virtually and some other states as well, just not the national convention. Yeah, Marshall, there's that whole montage of former Democratic presidential candidates saying nice things about Joe Biden last night. No sign of John Hickenlooper anywhere. No sign of Michael Bennett right there. And this is embarrassing for me as a political reporter, but there was actually one guy in the montage that I could not <laughs> identify immediately, and I had to Google, uh, and it was Seth Moulton of Massachusetts. I'm sure you knew that, Marshall. I, yeah, I, I let you have that on Twitter. I didn't want to add to that uh, pressure that you sometimes feel. I will say at least Bennett did say some nice things about Biden to us. Maybe he just saved it for the local viewers. Sure. Hey, yeah, we'll take that, too. Thank you, Marshall. So this is weird to say, but there is no evidence that Tom Hanks, the famous actor, is a cannibalistic pedophile. Colorado Republican congressional candidate Lauren Boebert gave a wink and a nod to that debunked QAnon link conspiracy theory on social media last night. Boebert has expressed support for QAnon, which is a baseless conspiracy theory that President Trump is fighting a secret war against pedophile Democrats who drink the blood of children. Boebert's tweet about Tom Hanks referenced his Greek citizenship. That's basically code because some QAnon followers believe that Hanks's dual citizenship in Greece is an attempt to escape child abuse charges, pedophilia charges. Boebert has continued her open flirtation with QAnon cultists since she upset Republican Congressman Scott Tipton in a primary and made the general election. Tom Hanks actually received his honorary Greek citizenship for his humanitarian work on behalf of Greek wildfire victims in 2018. Incidentally, there are several massive wildfires currently burning in the western Colorado district that Boebert seeks to represent in Congress.
Colorado's already short on cash. Pandemic costs money. So does fighting fires. So what now? It's been 100 years since women won the right to vote. A Coloradan stands ready to create America's monument to those suffragettes. Next. It is no secret the Colorado state government does not have a lot of money lying around with the state of the economy. Pandemic has been expensive. And now with wildfires burning around our state, we are curious how that impacts state finances. So this year's fires so far have not been as expensive to fight as what we've seen in years past. We're actually way behind where we were just a couple of years ago in terms of firefighting costs to the state. In comparison uh, to that same time frame uh, through August 16th of 2018, the state uh, had 18 responsibility fires versus nine this year. Responsibility fires, we'll talk about what that means. So 2018 was the year that Colorado saw the 416 fire, Spring Creek fire, Lake Christine fire, among others. At this point in the summer of 2018, Colorado had spent $40 million on wildfires. This year, we've only spent about a quarter of that, $10.5 million estimated. All four of the major fires that are burning in Colorado right now are primarily on federal land. They're in national forests, means that the federal government's going to cover most of that cost. Colorado helps to pay to defend the nearby state land and the private property that's involved. The head of Colorado's Department of Public Safety said the total hit to this year's budget next is going to take a while to figure out. Those numbers are uh, going to, are, it's only going to be an estimate at this point. The numbers are not finalized till usually at the end of the year when we have time to do that. Stay tuned. Hope for rain. The Aurora Police Department warned business owners to brace for violence and property destruction from a march in memory of Elijah McLean. A march has since been canceled. That letter went out to 100 plus businesses on East Colfax. Part of the letter reads, quote, the Aurora Police Department wanted you to be informed so you could take any lawful precautions you feel are needed, end quote. This did not go out to residents, just to businesses. Spokesperson for the police said they chose not to send it to residents after the event was canceled. Elijah McLean died after he was restrained and medicated by Aurora Police and paramedics. His death has led to national condemnation and reform of the Aurora Police Department, along with multiple investigations and a civil rights lawsuit. McLean's mother said that she did not want this particular march to happen. She said it didn't actually honor the memory of her son, and she didn't think it got the family any closer to justice. And the records just keep on coming. 100 degrees today, the second day in a row with a record high in the first day of the season with that triple digit number. Couple that with the smoke, the haze, the high fire danger, and it's been pretty miserable the last few days. No signs that this pattern's changing. There's moisture rotating around high pressure, but those high base storms are bringing wind and lightning to the foothills and not the rain we need, and certainly not enough wind to mix out the particulates. So another air quality alert for heavy wildfire smoke and ozone. And with this high pressure anchored where it is, the heat goes on right into the weekend. Partly cloudy 64 tonight. Smoke and haze a part of our forecast on Wednesday. An isolated foothill thunderstorm. We actually see the numbers ramp up over the weekend before cooling off again the first part of next week. Hang in there. They fought for the right to vote. A century later, a sculptor in northern Colorado is fighting to give them the national honor they deserve. That's next. One hundred years ago today, many American women were given the right to vote. Nineteenth Amendment was ratified on this day in 1920 after the decades long women's suffrage movement. Our Katie Eastman and photojournalist Ann Herbst spoke with a sculptor in northern Colorado who came up with an idea to build a monument in Washington to honor the women who fought and won. Yeah, it's really sticky. Each day in this Loveland studio. <laughs> Jane D. Decker makes a mess before she makes a masterpiece. I love the process part of it. <laughs> a process that can be as complicated as the stories she sculpts. Two women don't create a movement. I, I mean, I mean, I think it was a lot more than that. So when Jane set out to honor the women who paved the way for our right to vote, Alice Paul, she found more women. Sojourner Truth, 
um, Ida B. Wells. Black women who marched even as they were forced out of the movement. This is uh, Mabel Ping Lau. Chinese women who advocated for the vote knowing they wouldn't get one. We want to tell a complex story. 100 years after the 19th Amendment was ratified. <laughs> yeah, 100 years. Yes. Jane is fighting too. And so it's time. Time for a monument in the nation's capital dedicated to the 70 years women campaigned for the right to vote. And there's a quote from Susan B. Anthony. Oh, if I could live 100, 100 more years and see the, all the work for women that has been done and the fruition of all the work for women. And I just think, would she be proud of what we've done? I don't know. <laughs> I think so, but. This year, the U.S. House passed a bill to make her monument possible. President Trump voiced his support last week, but the Senate has yet to take action. And we're hoping they don't forget our anniversary. That's all I can say. Jane knows the process is never straightforward, that it took grit for these women to fight for her. We don't have 70 years to get this monument done. <laughs> so she'll fight for them no matter the mess. You know, it's amazing that they dedicated their lives for this for this cause, for our privilege. So we can't take it lightly. For next, I'm Katie Eastman. Though the 19th Amendment claimed to give all American women the right to vote, of course, women of color had to wait longer for that right. Native women were granted the right in 1924. Chinese immigrants couldn't vote until 1943, more than 20 years later. And it was 45 years later that black women in America were given the right to vote. You always get the final word around here. Your feedback is next. It's a sign that social distancing is still very much a requirement. In Palisade, they would like you to stay one cow length apart. It's appropriate because this is the purple cow coffee shop in those parts. Our producer, Kevin, on vacation, sent this our way. Always working, uh, that Kevin. Uh, if the sign looks somewhat familiar, a uh, similar one was out at the Gaylord Rockies Resort for the National Cattlemen Conference. Uh, they also said, one cow's length apart. They would not steer you wrong. Twice the kids in this home, twice the dad jokes on this program. I'm not going to apologize for that. Margaret doesn't like the fact that we are asking about a discussion about loosening COVID-19 restrictions in the state. She says, in three months, it's flu season and likely renewed COVID surge season. So seriously, ease up? just to shut down again? Well, Margaret, I think that's the reason why we have this discussion. I think if people are going to be told the current restrictions stay until next spring, we should know that now. Like getting strung along week by week doesn't quite seem productive. Uh, Karen also thinks we're missing the mark. She says, Kyle, you don't seem to understand that easing the restrictions would raise the positivity number. Opening schools one thing at a time. Let's see how that goes first. Karen, I also think that is a very good suggestion to see what happens when we open schools. But I also think that we can be having the discussion and getting people ready to know, are they hanging in with the current level of restriction clear through 2021? See you next time.